Anyone who knows me knows that I'm a sucker for barbecue. And especially when it's succulent, authentic, real, fresh, healthy, that's what I'm all about. So right now, I'm excited to bring you into Stony Creek and we're gonna go inside and we're going to meet Ronnie right here at Ronnie's Rotisserie. Behind the scenes, right here with Ronnie. Ronnie, I am so excited. Thank you for coming out To be back here. Thank you. Uh, I've heard nothing but great things and I walk in here and the smell is just driving me crazy because it's, my mouth is watering and I just walked in the door. It's from the charcoal. It is from the charcoal, yeah. there's no yeah. question about yeah. it. So uh, what is it that you're gonna be doing for me today? Today we're doing our uh, famous chicken kebab platter. Um, so it's house made yogurt. That's the base of our marinade uh, on top of chicken thighs. They get grilled on a charcoal and served with rice and two cold sides. Today we're gonna be doing uh, house made hummus and uh, fresh tabbouleh. Oh, I love it. See, the, the flavors are all, I, I can taste it already. Yeah. So show me how this, is, how this awesome. comes together. So here we have uh, boneless chicken thighs. Okay. And it's our base for a marinade. So we start off with a little bit of a sugar and salt. Okay. Uh, some paprika for color and a little bit of sweetness. And then some onion powder for some depth of flavor. I think onion powder is underrated. There's so many things that it can get used in, and the way it comes together, it just builds like from the base as far as the flavor is concerned. Really nice. Totally agree. And then here we have a house made yogurt. House made yogurt? House made yogurt. Okay, so how do you make your house made yogurt? So we culture it in house. Uh, we use a ratio of uh, three to one of homo milk and a um, half and half, 10% milk. Okay. Um, and then to make it thicker, almost like uh, Greek style yogurt. We let it ferment for about 20 hours. So now we're just gonna mix all the marinade together. So why is it that you put yogurt in your marinade? Uh, several reasons. One is flavor. Two, um, you get some natural tanginess that works well with the chicken. Um, and then it just marinates the chicken better. Well, I mean, that's a good enough reason. Why? Because it makes it taste better. Yep. I'm sold. So now we're gonna start skewering the chicken. That isn't a typical skewer as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that it looks like a fence post or a medieval sword. These are very traditional uh, skewers that are found in the Middle East. If you look at the shape of a chicken thigh, right? Mm -hmm. You have a relatively flat piece. This would not work well in a very narrow skewer. Uh, when we use a, th a broad skewer like this, you get a nice even distribution of, of, of the muscle. So when we go to cook it, it's nice and flat. Uh, we also get the max amount of contact on, on the charcoal from this side, mm -hmm. and all the skin will be nice and brown. That's gorgeous. I notice you're putting the skin all on one side as well. You're not like rotating this. It's all, like currently it's face up. Absolutely. And why do you do that? Uh, so when we start cooking it, uh, we go skin side up. Uh, what that does is, if I take chicken like this and put it on the barbecue, um, the skin is gonna sag and it's gonna start burning from the edges. Okay. When we cook it skin side up first, um, the muscle will actually um, get a little bit harder and it'll be a lot more firmer. So when we go to flip it on the other side, it's nice and flat. That's incredible. So it doesn't sag and you get nice even uh, cooking on, on, on the skin. And these guys will sit in the fridge over 24 hours to marinate the flavor into the meat. So the way we let the fire here is a little bit un unconventional. Uh, we use a blowtorch to get a few hot spots going on the charcoal. Then we have a foot fan going. It forces the air into the charcoal. Uh, it speeds up the burning process. We get a nice hot cold, uh, embers. So our charcoal is ready now. Nice and hot, smoking hot. red. So now we're gonna grab our chicken that's been marinating for 24 hours. This has been sitting for like at least 24. Yes, in a walk-in fridge. So skin side up again. That is really close to those embers. One of the challenges of cooking with charcoal is that it's not like gas or electric where you press the button, you let it set and forget it. Uh, so right now what we can see what's happening is the front line of the, of the coals are not burning hot enough. So what we're getting is a little bit of uneven cooking. Right. Um, so be charcoal's beautiful, amazing flavor, but one of the downsides is that it takes a little bit more um, effort and time to make sure that it comes out well. Okay, so really you just have to be a little bit more careful, pay a little bit more attention to the heat, of the charcoal to make sure that it's balanced. Absolutely. Look at the sizzle on that. It is so good. Wow. The aroma is just. No, the best part when you hear the mouth watering. Crispy skin. Oh, look how juicy that is. 
So now for our uh, dish, what we're gonna have is basmati rice with peas and carrots, seasoned with a little bit of curry. So we put a little bit of mild sauce on top of the rice. Our mild sauce, once again, homemade yogurt, garlic, and fresh basil. And then you get an option of four sides. Today we're gonna be doing uh, fresh made tabbouleh. And then our best selling side here, we have homemade hummus, roasted red pepper, caramelized onions, raw garlic, roasted garlic, and it's topped with uh, house-made basil oil. So at this point we can transfer our chicken over on top of the rice. We have a uh, hot sauce, so we have um, fire roasted Thai green chilies with the same house-made yogurt and a little bit of garlic. And you fire roast those chilies Absolutely. right here? Yep. Of course they do, why wouldn't they? Okay. Okay, I'm, I, I can't wait anymore. Enjoy. Am I ready? This Absolutely. It's all here? Ready. Okay, like this this chicken, I gotta taste this chicken just by itself first. That charcoal is so nice. It's not as overpowering as I thought it would be. It's got this really nice balance. Yeah, absolutely. And the paprika is coming out really yeah. nice as well. Yeah. That sauce is really beautiful. Okay, this is heaven to me. All of this is just decadent. Decadent and simple, and I think that's the part that I'm really excited about this because individually all the flavors are not complicated. Not, not by any they're means, not. they're not complicated yeah. at all. But the way they work together, it's just magic. Yeah. The one thing that we try to focus on is freshness. Everything we try to make out in-house uh, and try to add a, a vibrant, fresh component to every dish. Well, there is no doubt yeah. that you have nailed that on the head Thank you. with this. Ronnie, I can't tell you how excited I am awesome. to tell everybody at home about Ronnie's Charcoal Barbecue. Thank you so much, Thank my you, friend. Thank you, coming out. You have to come and check this place out. Stony Creek, Ronnie's Perfect Charcoal Barbecue. My name is Chef Dan, and this is Hamilton Eats. Balanced mind and balanced flavors are the two major components about cooking in a kitchen. Now I got a parking ticket this morning, so I've decided I'm gonna make a lemongrass stock. Why? Because the best way to get the flavor out of your lemongrass is to beat it up. Make sure that you take those bulbs, use the back of your knife, give it a good press, give it a good push. That parking ticket was really not necessary this morning, yet I still have to deal with it. Once this is all said and done, I can take this incredible lemongrass that has now allowed me to relax a little bit, take all of this, put this into a beautiful stock with fresh herbs and vegetables, simmer that out, and the lemongrass keeps me balanced, keeps your flavors balanced. So I'm really digging these cool little finds for great food in Hamilton. And if you're on Concession Street, just east of the Sherman Cut, you're gonna find this great little place. And we're gonna go in and we're gonna talk to Joanne, the mastermind behind Crumb Buns Bake Shop and Cafe. So we are here behind the scenes at Crumb Buns with Joanne. Joanne, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you very, very Thank much. Thank you for coming. It smells unbelievable in here. I was saying when, when I first walked in that this is one of the best smells in the world is walking into a bake shop. So what are you gonna make for me today? Today we're gonna make crumb buns. The crumb buns. The banana crumb buns. Okay, I love it, I love it. So show me how this happens. Okay. So first we throw the bananas in to liquefy them. Okay, so you're using like ripe bananas, yes. but they're not, not overly ripe bananas. Yeah, not overly ripe or it will make the mixture too moist. I love bananas. This is just, you know what, James, I know you don't like bananas, uh, but I like bananas. <laughs> We're gonna add in the butter. And what kind of butter are you using? Is it salted butter, unsalted butter? This is unsalted butter. And at this point, we're just you're just creaming your sort just of Just like creaming the butter and the bananas together right now. I'm gonna add the sugar. Just, just a little bit of sugar. 
Right, we just... Yeah, there's not much sugar. Yeah. <laughs> it's relatively healthy. <laughs> well, there's fruit in it. Yeah, the fruit is what makes it healthy. So once it's well blended, I then add the eggs as well as the vanilla. So vanilla extract, eggs, bananas, sugar, butter. Like it's really not a bad combination no matter which way you look at it. Yeah. So you're not necessarily worried about this com being completely smooth. No, no, there's supposed to be clumps of the butter in it. It just melts in. And I add in the baking powder. Give it a little stir. And I'll slowly add in half of the flour. So why do you only add half the flour in at this point? Um, I want to add half the flour in because there's also milk going into this. And I just want to alternately add the, add the flour and the milk. And this, I'm assuming that this helps to keep it like blending together relatively smooth so you don't end up yeah, with like big flour clumps. Yeah, relatively smooth so there's no big flour clumps. You always want to start with the flour and then end with the flour as well. I can see what you mean by when putting the flour in right at the end, all the, the liquid, it's just, it, it blends it together. So kind of like when you make a, a, a pasta dough, the flour and the water, it has to come together in the right way. Or it makes perfect sense. So now that our mix is done, we're going to bring it over and then we're gonna start on our crumble. Throw in the brown sugar and the flour. Give this a little mix first. Then we're gonna cut in the butter. Just unsalted butter, yeah. salted butter? Uh, this one is actually a salted butter. Okay. Just to give the crumb a little bit more of a taste. Okay, so I have to ask you. Yeah. We're, you're making crumb buns, right? Yes. So these are the crumb buns. The store is called crumb buns. Can you fill me in here? Because what's a crumb bun? Okay, most people are unfamiliar with crumb buns. So crumb buns, they're very uh, popular in America. Okay. Uh, back in 1947, my grandfather and my grandmother went on their honeymoon in Flint, Michigan, and they first tried a crumb bun. And since it was symbolic, my grandfather called my grandmother his crumb bun. So Aww. anytime he would address her, it would be crumb bun. So this is named after the recipe, but your grandma was Was called? my grandfather's crumb bun. When my grandmother was in the hospital after she broke her hip, I would go in and I would bring oatmeal raisin cookies to her all the time. And she was very set that one day I needed to open up my own bakery. So before she passed away in 2010, I promised her that one day I would open up a bakery and it would be named after her, which would be Crumb Buns. <laughs> and this is why people need to know the history behind these places. And I'm so excited. I can tell you right now, this is automatically gonna taste better because of that story. <laughs> so once we get to the right consistency, which it's at now, just little pea-sized crumbs, we are ready to go. So if I could get you to help me, Dan. Sure, absolutely. Maybe you could lift this up while I scoop half of our mixture down. We're gonna put half on, half the crumble. Okay. And then lay the next halves down. So just in the middle? Yes, please. That's about That's good. That's good? That's great, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I helped. <laughs> now we're ready for some of the crumb ball. Just gonna sprinkle bits. You're not mixing this in, you're just like sprinkling no, it on just top? just sprinkling it on top. So we're going back. All right. Do you want me to do anything specific uh, here? Maybe just we're gonna it over, all over the place. All over, kinda. okay. I'm gonna try not to break anything <laughs> while I do this. Right, we're gonna scoop this all out. Now we're just gonna spread this. I don't know if I've ever seen a process like this before where you're, you're almost blanketing your, your dry crumb with your wet ingredients. So you've got this double layer in here. That's really cool. Yes, it's almost like, a, so once it's cooked, it's like a little bit of a crunch in the middle. Now it's ready for the rest of the crumb. So we're just gonna lightly sprinkle it on top. We don't want too much covering it. I really like that you've got this, it's very much uh, like the classic sort of crumble 
that goes on top. So you can see where you've got these, these little butter clumps that were cut in with your pastry cutter that when this bakes, it's gonna add this sort of rich, crispy, yet moist kind of, well, crumb, really. I'm trying to find a different word for it, but there isn't. That's exactly what it is. Nice spoon, our awesome. scoop, and we're ready for the oven. Okay. And I'll bake for about 25 minutes. So it's done, it's ready. Oh, if you could smell this right now, you would be smiling the way I am. Gonna throw a glaze on it. It's a icing sugar and milk. That's it, just icing sugar and milk? Icing sugar and milk and wow. just doing a drizzle over. So the bittersweet torture that I go through is waiting for these crumb buns because this is a process and the love that goes into this is tremendous. But now is that final moment. It's the moment. Okay, so this is cooled, but it's still, it's still warm. Yes. So I'm getting this like still ooey gooey and delicious. And that, that one's for me. This one is for you. <laughs> See, right out of the pan into my hands. I'm not waiting anymore, by the way. Yeah. You've done enough to torture me. Mm. I'm gonna weep just a little bit. Um, that is really good. That is unbelievable. And you know what really, what's really cool about this? You get that, that layer of that crumble that went all the way in the middle. And the banana is like, it's, it's subtle. It's not like a banana bread. It's not like right out there banana, but it's just gives this beautiful little sweetness to everything. That is just incredible. That's really good. You have to come here and check out these crumb buns. Nana's crumb buns. Thank you so much. My name is Chef Dan and this is Hamilton Eats. of the bar, we're talking about bitters. Now you can either make your own or you can buy them, but today we're gonna be talking about how to make them. So I'm working on this gorgeous gin cocktail right now. So to bring out all of the natural flavor base in the gin, I'm using grain of paradise, orange peel, coriander, and juniper, mixed in with some pure grain alcohol. Now I use one teaspoon of spice to two ounces of alcohol. Give it a little shake. About once a day you're gonna wanna come back and do the same thing for about three days, maybe to 10 days. What you wanna do is come back and taste it. And when you get it to the, where you want it to be, then you know you're ready. Here's a little trick. When you think you might have it, put a couple of drops into soda and taste it because that's what it's gonna taste like in your cocktail. And remember, when you are making your cocktail, you only want just a few drops to make your cocktail sing. Enjoy. So I'm really excited today because I'm gonna go into a place that's been a staple in the dining scene here for over 10 years in Hamilton. We're gonna go inside and we're gonna meet Chef Phil right here at the Augusta House. in the back of the house at Augusta House. Chef Phil, I am very, very happy to be here today. What are you gonna make for me? Uh, today we're gonna do a chicken roulade, um, and that'll be paired with a chicken and sausage jambalaya and a side of cornbread. Oh, that sounds great. So how does this come together? Okay, well we start by packing the chicken with the sausage. Okay. So what kind of sausage are you using in your roulade? Uh, it's an andouille sausage. Nice. And then we just roll that up. So an andouille's got a nice, it's got a little bit of spice to it, and yeah. a good paprika flavors in there. That's delicious. Very nice, robust flavor. And then we just roll that up in bacon. Okay, so your roulade is like an old school kind of a technique, and this is, 
something for for those of you at home who don't who aren't aware it's the it's sort of the process of either stuffing protein and rolling it or wrapping it but it's really it's this nice tight little package that you can by the time it's all done get a nice cool slice out of it really nice from there we sous vide that for about two hours then we uh, we cool it so that it's ready to serve when we get an order okay now that our chicken's been sous vide we're gonna go ahead and sear that off and we just want to get this nice and brown all around really lock in the flavors. Now that's really cool. I really like that you sous vide this chicken. And it's one of those techniques that I don't think a lot of people sort of understand. So yeah. check this out. This is how Phil put this roulade together initially. And it's the fresh chicken breast that's stuffed with the andouille sausage and then wrapped in the bacon. Well then from here, he takes it and vacuum seals it in a, in a vacuum pack bag. And it goes into a water bath set at a very specific temperature and it cooks and it cooks everything and infuses all that flavor in and that's why this chicken over here and the bacon you can see how tight it is and how much it's shrunk and it's a really fantastic technique to infuse flavor and guarantee moisture which I think is wonderful I'm I am very intrigued buddy this is fabulous I like to consider bacon a vegetable because that's how much I want to eat it. That's, when I say I'm gonna eat my veggies, bacon falls into that mix for me. All right, so we're pretty much ready for the oven now. Okay. And what uh, what temperature do you have your oven set at for this? Uh, our oven's at 500, just okay. to shorten cooking times a little. Okay, so now we can start on the jambalaya. Okay. Uh, just a little oil in the pan, get that hot. Season the oil. And then from there, we can add our mirepoix. We're gonna sweat this out a little, let pan brown. Awesome. Now sweating is a technique that not a lot of people get as well. It's where you're softening up these vegetables without browning them so much so that you keep the fresh flavor without changing the flavor or changing the color as well. Okay, so now that we've browned the veg off a little, we can deglaze the pan. Here we use a little bit of white wine. And then from there, we can add our proteins. Okay, so what did you add in here now? Uh, this is just some pre-cooked chicken and some more andouille sausage. Nice. So you're using the same flavor profile in your jambalaya that you've got stuffed in your chicken. Add some of our jambalaya seasoning now. And now the rice. And uh, here we use the alcorio rice, uh, just to kind of put a little, our own spin on a signature dish. That's a great spin. Thank you. It's gonna be heartier as well. You're gonna get a lot more sort of, a lot more oomph to the rice. Okay, so now we're gonna deglaze again with a little bit of chicken stock and just kind of finish the rice off in that. Wow, you can really see the flavor that you've built right from the beginning. And when you deglaze that, all that, everything that might have potentially been stuck to the pan, all that flavor is just, just pressed and infused into that rice. That's gorgeous. And then we just let this reduce down. And we can throw our cornbread in the oven and bring that up to temp. Okay, our roulade should be done now. Oh, look at that color. Actually finish the jambalaya with the dollop of butter. Ooh, now you're nicely. talking. So by finishing with butter, it just creates this beautiful gloss on the rice and that finished mouthfeel is just so velvety. It takes all those flavors and it just coats your palate in a way that really, really works. Oh, you can hear that crispy bacon on the outside too. That is a beautiful thing. I say this a lot, 
but if you could smell what I smell right now, your mouth is gonna be watering like mine is. So I'm really, really excited for this. We're gonna get right in. Look at that andouille sausage stuffed right in the middle of that gorgeous roulade. This is a beautiful thing. All right, so I'm gonna get a little bit of everything. I got bacon and chicken and sausage. Throw a little bit of rice on there. That is so tender. There's just a little bit of heat in that rice. Sweetness, the, uh, wow, that andouille is perfect. It's that perfect balance of spice and flavor. There's no shortage of that sort of Cajun style feel, but it's not overpowering at all. And look at this cornbread. That is a beautiful thing. You really know what you're doing, my friend. Thank you. Cornbread is so sweet. Everything about this is, ex is super exciting. I gotta tell you, Phil, I'm so happy to be able to enjoy this and I'm gonna continue to enjoy this and everyone at home needs to go do that as well. My name is Chef Dan, this is the Augusta House and you need to come check us out right here on Hamilton Eats.